And what gave rise to all of this? Well, identity theft issues. So we're going to touch on that problem as well. Then we're going to spend a little time on the law. Yeah, that is not designed to put you to sleep. But it is important that we be at least familiar with some of the laws out there that we could run afoul of if we're not taking proper care of the information that we have and if our insurers aren't taking proper care of that information. We're also going to talk about some things that you can do to help prevent an identity breach and some of the things that we should do after we have an identity breach to try to mitigate some of the damage. Here's a fundamental question on this thing. The state insurance department said to us, and it said publicly, and it said to all the petitioners, quite publicly and quite clearly, if you sue us on this, on this regulation, we will not meet with you. We will not talk to you. We won't answer your phone calls. We will not respond to your correspondence. And they've been true to their word on this thing. Okay? So we said, okay, well, now we, we are in the advantageous position of having two associations that represent producers. I understand the other association was actually here yesterday talking about this. This very thing. Some people may have sat through that and seen this as well. Okay, one of the associations is bringing the lawsuit, and therefore is precluded from sitting at the table to try to implement this regulation. When we go into this regulation, your eyes are going to open up because you're going to see how much work we need to do to get from regulation to January 1st, where you can actually understand what this thing is going to tell you to do. There's a lot of work to be done. So we decided, you know what? It's more important for us to be at the table because guess who else is at the table? Rims is at the table. Consumer groups are at the table. The big five are at the table who are uh, obligated through their, through their uh, uh, settlement agreements to support this thing are at the table. Joe Palmer is at the table arguing that we still should get rid of contingent commissions because this is a bad thing for the sale of insurance in the state of New York. So we said, you know what, instead of joining the lawsuit, we need to be at the table. We need to be working on this stuff. This is an illustration of what we're working on here just to give you a general framework in addressing any of those misconceptions. I'm sorry I took more than three, three minutes to talk about that, but I thought it was important to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's get into what Reg 194 requires producers to do, and I'll walk through this thing, okay? We're at the point now where I've talked about, we've implemented the regulations, adopted, there's an effective date of January 1st, 2011. Put an asterisk on that date. Put an asterisk for two reasons. One is we talked about an Article 78 lawsuit. They had oral arguments on the Article 78 lawsuit on October 15th at all the county Supreme Court. I sat through the oral arguments. They've added, they've requested an expedited review from the, from the judge who was hearing the case, but January 1st is coming really fast. And, it, and its expectations are it may or may not get a decision by January 1st. So there's the first asterisk by that date that it might be. The second asterisk by that date is the circular letters we're going to talk about is currently still in draft form. We've been working on this thing forever. And in fact, we went into the insurance department originally when the, when the regulation was presented to us. And it, oh, by the way, it was presented to us as we think you're going to like this and, and we don't think there's any questions involved in this thing. And we, and we opened it up and immediately we said, are you kidding me? We said, hey, you know what, I can come up with 100 questions that we could came back with that. And then we convinced the insurance department, we said, you know what, we need some implementation guidance on this thing. We need to answer these questions. We need to know what compensation is. We need to know when you can tell whether it's in connection with the sale policy. We need to know who a producer is. That sounds stupid, but a producer could be the agency, could be all the sub-producers in the agency, could be all of the above, and all of them have implications on the implementation of this regulation. We said, we need to answer these questions. The insurance department agreed with us and said, you know what, we agree with you. If you think you need implementation guidance, Go ahead and write it and send it back to us. So that's exactly what we did. We wrote the circular letter ourselves. We went back to our board and we said, okay, who do we think the producer should be? What would be the easiest way to comply with this? What would make the most sense? And we addressed a number of those questions, wrote the, wrote the circular letter, gave it back to the department. The department looked at it and they came back to us with another draft, which is at the stage that we're at now. We've put some more comments into there, sent it back to them, and they're coming back again. I think they, I can't speak on their behalf, but I think they underestimated the time period that it would take to actually get to the final publication of the circular. How do we handle this business sometimes? Are we sometimes less thorough with BOR business than we are with new business? Not anymore. Not anymore, <laughs> not if we're smart, right? But what used to happen a lot of times, and still does happen with a lot of agents, they take a policy over by VOR and they just let everything go. Now we established an hour ago that there are some people who probably shouldn't be selling insurance and writing insurance policies. Now, you don't know me very well, but I don't have very good luck. So if I decided just to copy somebody else's work, and remove the policy as is, what are the chances that the guy I copied the work for had no idea what he was doing? Very good. 
And do we oftentimes pick up policies like that? And when you're talking to the insurers, you can't imagine why in the world coverage is written the way that it's written? Point is, with BORs, we really need to be as thorough as we would be if we were writing new business. We need to sit down and ask all the same questions of the insured, talk about all the same issues we would talk about with the insured, and then talk to him about why the policy he has is maybe not written in the best way for him. So we need to be more thorough than we're being. Do you all have a standard form that you're using in your office for BOR? Are you including some type of hold harmless wording? Good. Here's where this can become important. If there's hold harmless wording in your BOR letter, where basically your insured is holding you harmless for the errors of the prior agent, is that going to help if I've been the agent of record for two months and I just renewed the old policy that was wrong and it's still wrong? Is that going to help me? No. Absolutely not. Here's where it could help you, though. Do you sometimes take a policy over on a BOR right before the expiration date? Your insured may not have a copy of the policy to give you, but he knows the carrier and he knows the policy number. Can you take a BOR with most carriers right up until the renewal date? Yeah, most carriers will.